live here at the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by John Philbin of Return of the Living Dead and Children of the Corn and Point Break and all kinds of stuff. It's very cool to have you here. Good to be here. Yeah. And as we said before, and I can't believe you've never been on the show. I've, I've, we've had just about everyone from Return of the Living Dead on. Have you? How did And how did they go? How did they do? What did they have to say for themselves? Oh, it's always been really interesting. Um, it's one of my favorite uh, horror movies. Uh, watched a million times growing up, and and as an adult. And it's weird because it is a movie I think works differently at different ages. Because like as a kid, I just liked the zombies, and then as an adult, like it's a lot. Uh, you know, everyone's great in it, and uh, you see a lot of the comedy that maybe I didn't see as a kid. So. Sure. Yeah, of course. That movies are great for that. Yeah, and I do have Children of the Corn up here, which was your uh, your first. Uh, feature film so yeah. did you do a lot of acting before that like how did you get into uh how did you get the role of children of the corn it was my first film i i started acting in high school doing high school shows you know and then i went to college and when i was in college i auditioned for a couple of plays i wasn't and i ended up really loving doing acting in college and i decided by the time i was a sophomore in college that's it i want to be an actor so i I dropped out of the school I was in, which was UC Santa Barbara, and I transferred to USC to the acting program to do a conservatory. Because I thought if, I, if I'm going to be an actor, I want to live in LA. You know, I want to make be in movies and TV and shit. So I, I, I'd never lived in a city. I didn't know if I could handle it because I was kind of a surfer, suburban surfer kid, you know. And uh, so I moved to Hollywood, went to USC for three years, just did theater loved LA, loved the club scene, just became an urban, just loved the city, found my people. And when I got out of college, I had started, I did a play. I started auditioning for shit. And the first movie I, I got was actually Grand V USA, but I wasn't filming it till for another six weeks. So my agent slid me into an audition for Children of the Corn, said, this would be good for you. You've never worked on a film set. You're not even SAG but this will get you into SAG and teach you how to work in front of a camera before you go and do this really important film, you know, that's going to change the world and you're going to just chit, you're going to blow minds. It's going to set you up for the rest of your life, which is something no one's ever talking about, but people are still talking about turn of the corn. So I'm so grateful. He sent me on that little horror movie because horror has become this, like this godsend for my life, my whole life. You know, I grew up loving horror I ended up doing horror movies as an actor. Young actors do them because the young actors are cheap, are free, basically, and they need experience. So they do horror movies. That used to be the old formula. Yeah. Now horror movies cast cast movie stars. Times have changed. But when I was a kid, you did horror. Those are your first movies because you're you're a cheap actor, and you know that's the only thing you could get. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you were much older than than what you were playing in the movie. Cause yeah, I'm playing nineteen, right? And uh, I was twenty three, which doesn't seem like a big difference. Four years, but between nineteen and twenty three is a you know it's that's a big difference at that age. Yeah, a lot of people changed during those years. I, however, did not. I was a very <laughs> immature twenty three. I, I I was a late late physical bloomer. Physically, I was very and and mentally. <laughs> Very immature for my age. I've since then, you know, now I'm like more like, guess how old I am now? No, just kidding. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, I know I was playing, you know, but if you look closely, it's like I had hair on my chest, you know, like right. I, looked, I looked like a mature 19 year old in that movie. Mm -hmm. Like that guy's fucking like, he's old, he's a man <laughs> because I actually was, I was 23. Yeah. Time for me to go, in other words. Time for me to leave the flock, the group. <laughs> Did they ask you to shave the chest or anything at the no, time? No, they should have. You know, it wasn't yeah. that sophisticated of a... You know, I don't know if they gave thought to that. Those filmmakers, you know, aren't, they're not like, you know, this is going to be a teen heartthrob movie, even though I tried to make it that way about me and my character. But I didn't know to shave my chest because, you know, I'm not gay. So I didn't learn that until I did North Shore where the, you know, the, the, there were gay movie makers, you know, really successful who made hit movies. And they told me, I go, why do I have to wax my chest? It's so painful. And they're like, okay, I'll tell you. Cause young girls, teenage prepubescent and young girls are afraid of hair of men's body hair. It scares them. They don't like it. And that's who this movie's for. So we're waxing your chest. We're removing all of that. Got it. And I'm like, Okay, whoa. You know, like <laughs> it's very serious when you're yeah. talking about 
a lot of money at stake, you know, and, and, and big studio things. But this was a low budget, non-studio thing. I don't, I don't think they were thinking, girls are scared of chest hair, so we're going to shave John's chest. You know, no. Now I think about it all the time. But back then, it never even crossed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, along those lines, which is more uh, fun? Obviously, it's great to make more money on the bigger things. But uh, since everything's really broken down to like, like uh, you gotta, you gotta you remove the chest hair for certain reasons. What's the difference between doing a movie like that and doing a movie like Children of the Corn? Children of the Corn. I mean, I don't have you know it being my first film. You know, you I didn't have everything to compare it to. I guess I had nothing to compare it to at the time. I was just in this days you know of like oh my god this is you know yeah that was probably huge at the time for you like you know it's not going to get any bigger than this yeah this this is awesome i knew i was going to go to another movie right after that that was with movie stars you know it was you know it was with jamie lee curtis and patrick swayze and you know tommy howell who had just done outsiders and you know all these huge movie stars were going to be in this movie with me jennifer jason lee and troy donahue and carol cook and John Cusack, you know, and me, and we we're going to go make this movie that's going to change the world. And it was, I was, I, I was preparing for it by studying, you know, mentally challenged people. It was going to be, a, it's a big role and it was very emotional. And so when I did this movie, I was like, oh fuck, I'm just in over my head. I'm going to kill myself. I'm, I'm, I'm all in this cult. I'm just going to be this passive sheep that goes to slaughter. You know, how does, a, how does a human being feel when they're going to actually surrender themselves to death? you know, and, and who's, who's, I've drank in the Kool-Aid. So I basically just played it as a guy that was in sensory overload fear, but was making a choice to do the rituals and to step up as bravely and as, you know, heroically as possible, you know, for, for the, for the, he who walks behind the rose. It wasn't that much of a stretch for me because I was just overwhelmed being on a movie set with cameras rolling. And, but, um, when you go and do a picture where everyone is used to making, you know, like doing millions of dollars of business and, you know, there's other in there, there's executives that come in on helicopters and shit, you know, and have very specific critiques and, and, and comments and opinions, you know, like there's a lot of eyes on you and it's a little bit harder to focus on the simple thing of like being who you want to be in this for in that from action to cut forever for eternity what who do i want to be between action and cut for eternity you know that's what my where my i live that's what my focus needs to be i don't want it to be on is my chest hair showing or like do you know will the gays like me you know is my nose too big you know like How's is this? Can I not turn my head to the side because I have a weird fucking shaped head? You know, like, can't I just live realistically in the moment? You know, like sometimes in the bigger studio films, everything is so looked at so closely by so many executives or people outside of the acting business that really are into the results. And I tend not to. I don't want to focus on the results. I want to focus on the process. So I think in low budget independent films an actor like me, you know, is allowed to focus, you know, and that's what they want you to do in the big ones. You know, when you work for Spielberg yeah. too, you know, Catherine Bigelow, you, they want you in the moment, actually, you know, they've done the, they've cast you to play the part. You know, they, they don't, they don't want you to be concerned or self-conscious or afraid of anything. That's your job, you know, and, you know, but it's, it's just easier when there's not as many people looking at you, in my opinion, for me, for an actor like me, I'm not that great of an actor. I have to like totally get into it and block out all those distractions. There's just more distractions. The higher the budget, the more distractions there are. Time, everything costs a lot of money. Sometimes with low budget, you're just running and gunning and shooting and like you're just in the moment going, you know, what's happening? I just want to get through the scene, you know, and that works out just fine. Yeah. So what were the uh the uh since you're you're older than the other kids uh yes. what were the other what were the other uh young young actors like were, were how would I know with or? how would I know I never you know all I was the man of focus in a in a scene <laughs> uh -huh. there was my wife she yeah. was wonderful she we had like two lines together but she was extremely supportive of me you know clasping her hands and looking up as I sacrificed my as I 
presented myself. To, and then when I did the cut, I got to work with an older actor, Peter Horton, I think was his name. Just a total dick. And uh, that's fine. That's the part he was playing. And I was uh -huh. a total passive, like, sacrificial lamb. But uh, my wife was very wonderful. The children, at the children actors who were locals from the neighborhood, I never got to interact with them. And uh, John Franklin and Courtney Gaines, these two wonderful actors, it was also their first movie. I never got to interact with them either. <laughs> I just came in and did my own little thing, my own little separated part. My agent told me that's what it was. I was just this bubble in this movie. I'm not connected. I'm only in there for a week and then I'm gone and I go yeah. and do that other movie. And uh, I was in and out and uh, I didn't get, you know, I, I, li I really liked Linda Hamilton. We had a mutual friend in common. So I, I got to spend some time with her. And she was absolutely lovely. She was wonderful. And since then, 30 years, it's now 40 years later, 40 years anniversary. Yeah. I've become friends with Courtney Gaines and John Franklin because we do these conventions. Because I never talked to him on the set. I talked to John Franklin once. Fucking interesting guy. Never talked to Courtney. He was probably doing his own evil shit, Malachi shit. But uh, <laughs> I was... Um, I was on in and out, you know, trying to be James Dean. And then when when I got to back together again, I think it was 30 years, you know, 10 years ago when I when I saw them at a reunion, I was like, they're totally all in on this convention thing. And I was totally out to lunch on it. Now I'm all in. And it's like, you know, I it's not we're not the Rolling Stones, but I can like we get to be with our family. I get to fly to a place and see my little children of the corn family friends yeah. go out to dinners. Everyone's living in different places, has lives. And 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 be a part of a little family, you know that 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 we got lucky to be a part of something forty years ago, and now we love each other. You know, it's one of the, it's a wonderful aspect that happens very rarely in film, and it happened with us, and we're very grateful. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, I've had both John and uh, Courtney on the show, and uh, oh, John did was, you? Yeah, and John was actually a lot older too, and and I think he kept it a secret at the time, but he was like. Uh, in his 20s, I believe. And he played like a much younger uh, person at the time. Well, yeah. I mean, he came to L.A. and he looked younger than he was. And he said, yeah. oh, that's the golden ticket to work in Hollywood. You know, if you're if you're 22 and you can play 16, you look like a child, you know, a kid. You're going to work. And he did. And yeah. There's, yeah. We used to lie about our age all the time. Now it's just public knowledge. Nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was uh, What did your parents think of you doing a horror movie at the time? Uh, they didn't like it. You know, like my mom died when I was 20, so she never got to see me be a professional actor, but she knew I wanted to be an actor and she was very, very supportive of me. I love her very much for that. She's so supportive of me, but she died of cancer when I was 20. Then I went to USC, studied acting, started doing film, you know, and I just think about her all the time because I got to do this thing that, you know, she thought, I'm sure she never in a million years thought I would be a, you know, who gets to be a professional actor, you know, like, who gets to actually make films, you know, like very few people, but uh, I love her for being supportive. My father, on the other hand, is a business guy. And he was like, what are you going to do if it doesn't work out? And I'm like, I don't nothing. You know, what are you going to fall back on? I'm like, my ass, you know, I'm just doing this. He goes, I don't know, guy, you know, but then I started getting movies and he was like, whoa, you know, like, can I come to one of your premieres? And I'm like, yeah, come on. You know, like took him to Hollywood. I was like a total, it was blue, you know, it was over his head. It blew his mind. I didn't, it blew my mind. I was like overwhelmed you know, back in the 80s, this is the 80s. Mm -hmm. But when, you know, horror, my, when Children of the Corn came out, Return of the Living Dead came out, and the New Kids came out, three horror movies, New Kids isn't a horror movie, but three, you know, weird horror movies came out within the first five or six years, I was an actor, 10 years, they were really, you know, that's not a very good movie, John, like, I don't know if I can't watch it, you know, they're totally disrespecting it, mm -hmm. and totally criticizing me for being in these, these movies, you know, totally criticizing me for being in these movies. And I was like, you know, I would have a stiff upper lip and be like, you know, I had to be delusionally arrogant that I was, you know, so lucky in doing this thing. But, you know, it was uh, unbelievably, you know, uh, strange of them not to realize the astronomical odds against me ever being in a movie. And here I am in three within a, two years they might not like the content. Oh, those movies aren't good. Like, fuck you. Like, they're movies. So what? Yeah. I'm in them. Someone cast me in them. Then I went there and did the work. And then I got another one. And then I did the work and it's coming out. And then I got another one. I mean, for them, it's like, you know, they must have thought I was just maybe an egotistical 
narcissistic asshole. And the only way they could bring me back down to earth was to criticize the content of the films that I was lucky enough to be in mm -hmm. as if they're like film snobs and not, you know, but I, I wasn't as self-aware then as I am now. And I possibly was in order to have the confidence to go from film to film, you know, in your twenties as an actor, you might, I might've had a coat, a coating of delusional omnipotence, you know, and like, you know, but somewhere down inside and now I look back on it. Yeah. I just, if I knew then what I know now, I could be like, are you guys, you know, trying to make me feel bad? Cause I got to be in a movie. Are you jealous or are you, am I, did I say something to hurt your feelings? I mean, do you want to try to, are you trying to hurt my feelings by saying you didn't like children of the corn or you didn't like the new kids? Like that upset you, you, you know, you didn't like, yeah, the, we didn't make that. We didn't make that movie for you. You shouldn't be watching movies like that, except to praise my performance because you're my family and it would be nice to feel support from your family. But I've heard from a million actors that ain't going to ever happen. You know, some actors are lucky. They come from nice families. I didn't, you know, where people compliment their children's work in movies and horror movies or whatever. I didn't come from that family. <laughs> so, so I, I did, I was doing it for me, you yeah. know, not for them. And they didn't really appreciate it, but I'll tell you what they do now. There was a time, there was a time <laughs> yeah. when like, you know, I found out, you know, my dad was getting older and, you know, he had remarried after my mom had died and his wife was like, we weren't really friends or anything. And I'd, I'd been a professional actor for years and then I almost literally forgot I was an actor. I'd stopped working for like 15 years. I'd like quit and I was doing something else. I was teaching surfing full time. I, really, I literally forgot I was an actor. I was, I was a drunk. I was an alcoholic and drug addict and I was, you know, so far removed from Hollywood. And someone would remind me that I was an actor, my dad, and I would go to see, you know, my dad or some, go visit him once a year, whatever. And I would hear from his wife that he was proud of me for all the work I'd done because someone had come up to him at the club and said, my kids want to get your son's autograph because he's their favorite actor from North Shore, you know, a surf movie. They've got his pictures on the wall. Like, could you have him autograph it? And I'd like forgot, I was like forgotten I was even an actor. And my dad became this guy at the club, at the tennis club, whatever, that was proud that his son was an actor, you know, and that's, that's, you know, it took him 30 years to get there, but that's where he got before, you know, before, you know, now that's where he is now. He's like super proud, but there was a time when it was just like embarrassing, I think for him, you know, oh yeah, he was in this terrible movie. Like his movies weren't very, aren't very good. Like that kind of, you know, embarrassing talk to talk out loud about your son that way who's doing something that one in a billion human beings on the planet get to do yeah it's delusional to, to feel that way not to be just like oh he's just got he's the luckiest guy in the world but i'll listen i had the same delusion i thought i was i was resentful of hollywood that i wasn't you know I, I i do i'd work with spielberg or Catherine bigelow and then i wouldn't go on to work with a-list directors i'd do some shitty little movie and i'd be suck i'd suck at it and then someone so didn't want me and i'd be i'd be pissed i'd be resentful of hollywood but the fact is when i look back on it i was lucky and i'm grateful i got to do the things i got to do i was lucky i mean very lucky when you look at the whole world yeah. but when i was going through it i could only see life through my own i was so egotistical egocentric i just saw life through my own what i want what i'm doing what i can get when you get older you'll see when you're older your perspective changes you know you, you get more of a a broader, gentler perspective of, oh, wow, I was just this living human being trying to do, you know, like everyone's trying to do their little thing, you know, sometimes you get to do your thing, you know, not very often, but I've been lucky and I've got to do it a couple of times. So I should be very grateful, not resentful. No, <laughs> I, 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 like that, I, I like that answer because uh, not too often, but we've had guests on who don't necessarily look fondly on, you know, uh, a movie they did in the past. And that's always kind of uh, disheartening to me, but I'm, I, I like the way you look at that. And you talked about addiction since you brought it up. Did that, do you think looking back, the, well, first of all, I guess, when did that start? And did that affect, uh, do you think that affected you getting any roles? Most definitely. Most definitely. I was a drug addict, alcoholic in high school and through college. I got sober the day I graduated college because my free ride was over. You know, my father said, I'll pay for your education, but after that, you're on your own. Great. I'm on my own, you know, like I'm, I went to jail, I DUI, I was in jail wearing a kilt and eyeliner. I'd been to a punk club that night and I went to jail in front of the judge in a kilt, spent the night in jail in a kilt. Awesome. And, uh, 
went to AA by the judge, got sober, saw a bunch of actors in AA in Hollywood. I'm like, fuck, I can do this. You know, they can do it. I can, I'm like them. I can identify with actors who are sober because I want to be an actor, but I'm a drunk. So I, I'll never get a job as a drunk. I'll never make it doing drugs and alcohol. I'm just out of control. Even though it's a glamorous that you think, I thought it was glamorous back in the 80s to be an alcoholic and drug addict, but it's only glamorous if you're sober. So uh, I got I got sober, and then I immediately started working. I was lucky. It was a lucky time for me. You know, 1983, I'm a white male, athletic male, new to Hollywood, hadn't done any stupid, you know, children shit. You know, got horror movies, got lucky. Here, just plug them into this. War movie, plug them into that. Oh, Spielberg, plug him into that, you know, like he can surf, got a part in North Shore, you know, like got point break, you know, like he's a cowboy kind of, he looks like I got tombstone, you know, I got very lucky. And I did these cool white guy parts from the eighties and nineties. And then I stopped working. I stopped getting jobs. I stopped getting the jobs I wanted. I started getting bitter and resentful. I don't know if you, you know, in AA, there's a program. If you don't have emotional sobriety, this is, I'm speaking for myself. I was on what we call a dry drunk, angry, egotistical, upset. I wasn't helping anybody. I was living for myself. I wasn't living to be of service to other people. When I was coming up in that, I was like in service to the gods of film. You know, I, I mean, I am here to try to channel artistic creation for the higher service of the gods of film and the audiences that consume it. And I'm one of them. I'm a fan. I consume film. I love it. Love acting. But I got angry from all the rejection, you know, and I wasn't getting what I wanted. And I got an ego. I got self entitlement. The worst thing you can ever get is entitlement as an actor. You know, it's just oh, kills your creative juices, you know, like and it makes people look at you like, why would I want to work with you? And, uh, you know, I was just a dickhead and I was so angry that I, I had no program either. And I turned back to drugs. I, I might have gotten an injury or something, but I started taking drugs again. The next thing I know because I happen to be an alcoholic, I'm addicted to drugs. And I start drinking again and doing drugs. And that just made it so that I, no way could I work. I couldn't even go on auditions. Agents drop me, drop, drop, drop. I'm now I'm unemployed, un, unemployable, out of work actor with no life. And I, I didn't know what to do with myself, you know? So I had to, I, I, I couldn't deal with Hollywood anymore. Hollywood couldn't deal with me. Nobody wanted me and I didn't want them. I was angry. And uh, I, I only knew how to do one thing, which was surf and act, you know, but so, but I couldn't make a living act, money acting. I need to make money. So I started teaching surfing and I taught surfing for hardcore, all in, got sober, taught surfing for like 15 years. You know, I had a little relapse in there, but I got sober again. And when I was sober, going to AA meetings and stuff, these conventions rolled around and I started making little, little movies. You know, I made, I made uh, undateable John, you know, and I made this other, other movie like surfers would give me movies and stuff. And all of a sudden I'm an actor again, you know, and the only way I could do it is if I got sober. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing these conventions sober, you know, I'm not burning the bridges of the people that invited me there or passed out at my table, like a wrestler, you know, like, cause that's how I felt back then. Now I'm grateful for the opportunity to go on a convention and meet a fan. I thought I was a failure as an actor. I mean, I forgot I was an actor. I thought I was a failure as an actor until I got sober again, got clean, started doing these conventions, which are I'm lucky to be have been in these horror movies and meeting fans that have, you know, that appreciated my work. Now I'm grateful. And, uh, you know, I, I see that I have had a very fortunate career and I, I'm having a life because of it again, you know, a, a real life. So my, my thing has come full circle. Yeah. Without getting sober, I don't work. The only time I've ever worked, you know, like is gotten jobs, positive things is when I've been in the sunshine of the spirit, sober, you know, working a program, not yeah. just dry, but working a program. When you first uh, stopped, uh, when you first got sober, did you like, so the first convention you're at, um, did you like, was that scary? Because I know for me personally, uh, doing like social events, uh, <laughs> not drinking to me, I was like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Cause I also thought people only enjoyed being around me if I was uh, drinking. Well, that's not true for sure. People enjoyed you. Like, you know, it's so funny. You might not have enjoyed other people if you weren't drinking. I know <laughs> I didn't, 
-hmm. You know, I didn't, I wanted to be alone in my room, quite frankly. You know, uh, it took, you know, the transition between being a total drunk and being sober, I think AA helped. I mean, there's program AA where you, you have to talk about your feelings and you have to be able to express yourself to your men's group, to a tribe of people that you trust, that love you and want the best for you. Through that practice of the program, these little things that we do, you're able to, and it's only, it's a one day at a time thing. I'm all, I only have it if I give it away. I only have it temporarily. It's a gift. But when I have it, you know, they, it, it's a program that teaches you to talk. This is how I feel. And mm -hmm. also teaches you not, not to, you don't have to look up or look down at anybody. Everybody's equal in the program of AA. So that helps when you go into the arena of conventions, like this guy owns the convention, but he's still a human being. I'm grateful that he invited me and I want to do good work for him. I'm not going to go to my room and do blow and ha just have your assistant call me when someone wants to me to sign something. No, I'm going to sit at my table and be there in the hours that the fans are walking through to present. Even if no one's at my table, I got my banner up and I'm there in case someone wants to meet me, in case someone paid and came to meet me because I'm on the advertising. You know, yeah. I just want to do my part, do, you know, like you right, said, it looks good for the, it looks good for the convention. If everyone's at, you know, where they're supposed to be. And yeah. 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 I mean, I'm just a worker among workers there. It's a job. It's a good job, mm -hmm. but it's a job. And I, you know, I'm grateful for any job I had now because I was unemployable, literally unemployable in the film industry for like 10, 15 years. I could work in surfing because, you know, people just, I have a rep, you know, I have a reputation in the surfing world, but, you know, it was, I lost so many jobs there because people would be like, why this guy's drunk. He's fucking drunk, showing up drunk. So yeah, I, all that happened to get me here to a place where I'm grateful to go to for any job. I'm happy to do it. I'm answering these questions because it's like, there yeah. might be someone out there who's going through that stage. It was an awkward stage for me mm -hmm. and everybody should know anybody can get this thing if they want it. But, you know, it's a tough, I went through a tough, dark, selfish time. And if anyone wants to talk to me about it, feel free. I appreciate it. I was that. there and I'm here now. So uh, Return of the Living Dead, um, one of the things a lot of the people had mentioned to me when we've had them on over the, the years is uh, that you guys all have a chance to rehearse together. So it, looked, it really felt like that group of uh, friends, they were friends and they were around each other. And then, yeah. do you remember that, like the rehearsals and how much that helped? And nice. oh yeah, you always get that opportunity on different films. No. I suppose not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all said it was so special and rare because we got to rehearse, and that is very true. There are some acting jobs back in the '80s, you know, where in the '90s, where you had the luxury of rehearsal, and I'm sure there's really good high-end directors that like to rehearse too. You know, some actors don't like to rehearse. You know, like Joaquin Phoenix, he doesn't want to rehearse you know he wants to save his improv for when the cameras are rolling you know and that's you know that's just his style god love him you know whatever when he works with these english actors on on uh you know napoleon they're like what the fuck that wasn't the line you know they've been working on their line and how to say it exactly yeah you know for three months since they've had the part and they go in and he's like saying other things they, they just there's a moment of like insecurity on their face and that's the scene they take and they're like fuck <laughs> you know, these fucking Hollywood actors who improv, you know, you know, I, 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 I'm a Holly, I'm an overtrained LA Hollywood actor, underemployed Hollywood actor that hates to work too. I I'm very familiar with the improv, but, uh, it's such a, it's a, just a different culture, but we got lucky and we got to rehearse. The point is, yeah, he had time before we shot. He got a bunch of unexperienced, you know, actors together and we got to rehearse to the point where he saw what he needed to see to make his vision, which nobody knew but him, you know, to make his vision doable. Because when we started filming Time is Money and you, you have these actors, you can't afford to try to find it at, you know, 10 takes. It's not going to happen. You know, try to get it in three. That's the goal, you know, get this thing in three. Mm -hmm. And um, from the most part, from my point of view, that's what we did. You know, and we we're lucky to have those rehearsals. Very, very lucky. I, you know, I've been lucky a couple other times, but it's not the norm. Yeah. And uh, what I was, one of the things I think makes uh, Return of the Living Dead so great is the cast, and it's both the uh, the young actors at the time, the punk got people, and the veteran actors, and they both uh, both groups are great, and they play well off each other. And just what was it like working with some of the, the veteran actors? And uh, does that really up your game? I guess when you're you're, you know, 
acting against, you know, or with uh, someone who's who's done it for a long time? Not necessarily. It's like it all depends where they're at in their career and what, you know. Well, you kind know, of like we what you said about all, young people I getting – I don't want to interrupt you. I'm just saying what you said about, like, young actors getting horror movies. Also, at the time, sometimes it was people who were later in their career, like Clue Gulliger, who, from what I understand, didn't really look great at the movie until later on himself and, and was – Yeah, you know, he's a perfect example. I love Clue Gulliger. And, like, what a fucking guy. I saw him go through the stage where he's going down in his career – he can't really remember lines. He got this shitty little horror movie that he didn't understand. He thought he was better than the material. And he's like arguing with the director, but he's just unprepared. And he's got to write his lines down. He can't remember. He doesn't really know exactly what he's doing. I want to be Robert De Niro. I'm 100% all in prepared fucking going, what is this old guy fucking doing? You know, like <laughs> he's fucking, he's good. Look, he's got to look, you know, like, yeah, I could see him in the Western shoes, but you yeah. know, fuck, he hates this job. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, you know, it depends. You saw that everyone seen the picture of Marlon Brando with Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall's got Marlon Brando's lines taped to a card to his fucking chest. He's standing off camera, looking at him, holding Marlon's line. Marlon's looking down and reading his lines. So Marlon, you know, Robert Duvall got to work with Marlon Brando, the greatest actor of all time. You know, ask him about it. How was that for you? You know, like yeah. Marlon Brando's a genius, though. I mean, and that's during yeah. The Godfather. And you can't, you can't, that guy's a genius, right? So yeah, there's yeah. talent comes in. If Clue Gallagher, and here's a pretty good example. Clue, you know, he's got talent. So he can sit there and read the lines and look a certain way. And the camera makes it look like he's fucking thinking. You know, he's uh-huh. thinking about what the Lex line is and what the fuck he's doing. But it makes it think like he's thinking of how he's going to improve on the situation he's in, you know? And that's talent. That's a God-given talent. So you got these long, young actors who don't know shit. You know, they're just going, you know, they're trying the best they can to be De Niro, you know, or De- James Dean or whatever. I'm just talking for myself. And then you've got these old actors who've done a million things. They're just showing up just, you know, they already have this thing they bring with them, you know, like Clue. So, yeah, he thought this was a piece of shit. He argued about it. He probably wished he hadn't have done it. And then 10 years later, he's grateful he's done it. It's the thing he's most known for. And he's doing conventions, just loving the attention, you know, and that's an actor's curve, you know. James, Jimmy Cam- James, you know, James Karen is a fucking amazing cheerleader of a, of a, you know, a veteran, you know, and he's just making everybody's day. To see Tommy, Matt, Tommy, and, you know, with, with these, these older, now that guy's a fucking yeah. veteran, you know, and that that other guy who played the doctor, he's also dead too. The, we're, we're dropping like yeah. five, bro. He was just so, he had talent, you know, and he's working with Jewel Shepard, and there's Jewel Shepard working with a very talented, you know, guy. And it's, yeah, it's an interesting juxtaposition. I John Calfa was the, was the, was the character. Calfa, played, yeah, yeah. John Calfa, what a mad genius, you know, like doing, having, you know, here's a guy who took his part and just, expanded on it you know and and got into it and and then clue is a guy who's like what is this shit you know this suck <laughs> we suck you know but it actually and he ended up it being the greatest thing of his life you know yeah. it's just hollywood is, he's he survived to see that become something he was grateful for mm-hmm. you know and so did i yeah and and it was a that's a wonderful thing to to appreciate to just have the to be able to appreciate that circle mm-hmm and uh, uh, uh clue's awesome i remember meeting him several times at conventions and uh just a story real quick is uh so it was late at night at a convention annabelle uh my co-host here uh it was like midnight and we were ordering a pizza in and we're talking to clue and he's like he's gonna go hit the gym and i was thinking this guy's like uh, you know like in his 80s and i was like man he's way he's way more fit and, than, than i'll ever be and and he also just took out a razor out of his pocket and started dry shaving his face with no mirror and I, was, and I kept, I was thinking like, uh, first of all, like he must carry it around all the time. Does he just grow like facial hair all the time? So he has to carry a, a razor on him all the time. But it was, uh, I just thought he was such a great character. What a and character. I love his son too, but they're completely different people. Yeah. They're completely different people. But, but I mean, you know, then Quentin Tarantino can recognize that guy and put him in his movie yeah, and that yeah. can be in Quentin Tarantino's movie about Hollywood. You know, that is a, that's just a cool thing. You know, that, that's the good side of Hollywood, you know, and you can have an actor who's been through that, 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 those things, you know, I, I just, I just love seeing it. 
the, the moral of that is just stay alive <laughs> and show up and good things can happen. You know, if, if you stay and alive, it's incredibly up, uh, charismatic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he has, <laughs> he has a talent. That guy yeah, has yeah. a talent. Yeah. And what was Dan O'Bannon like? Because uh, I've heard mixed things from di from different people. Uh, Beverly Randolph doesn't have the greatest experiences with Dan O'Bannon. So I don't know. What was he like? I have nothing but great experiences with Dan. I mean, he didn't talk to me much. He didn't. He, there's nothing he wanted out from me. You know, like I'm not a girl. You know, like I did my part. You know, I thought I. He didn't. He, I had such little amount of attention from him that I thought I was doing bad. You know, like yeah. do I suck in this? You know, like you're not talking to me. You're like no, you're fine. Fuck, I'm fine. Like I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just <laughs> fucking trying to play it straight. Like is that right? He goes, you're fine. Don't worry about. It. Just do your thing. Like. I was like, should I take my name off this? I'm so glad I didn't. You know, like Chuck, I'm like no name. <laughs> <laughs> I tease people. I'm number four on the on the cast list. I don't know. I was I was on a pretty high run right then at the time. But you know, when you get the call sheet, there's there's numbers of the actors like, and I was number four. It's a great number on a cast sheet. <laughs> number one's the best. Doesn't mean you're the lead. But uh, yeah. but um, no, he was fucking great with me. I mean, I loved him. I, I'm, I'm grateful he cast me. You know, he could have cast a million people, you know, but he cast me and I got to play that new wave nerd who didn't fit in and nobody liked him. So nobody likes me, right? Everything I say falls flat and it's dead. It's not funny. I'm not like a cute guy from the John Hughes movie, even though that's like what I'm supposed to be, like the, the cute clown, you know. I'm just unlikable. No one gets me. And... You know, it wasn't until much later that, you know, doing these conventions that I learned, yeah, that a lot of people identified with that character, you know, so did I. I, I had been, you know, through a weird time when I was the outsider, like I wasn't punk rock, you know, and I wasn't a full new waiver, you know, but I was somewhere in between, but I wasn't one or the other all, all in and nobody really, I couldn't get the cool punk rock chicks that I wanted, you know, like, cause I was a nerd compared to them, you know, I didn't shoot heroin and. I didn't fight, you know, and I didn't have a mo shaved head like all those other guys in the movie did. You know, I was kind of like new wave, you know, which which actually I was kind of, you know, so I identified with that character a lot more than I I let on. But um, then I knew at the time when I look back, I went, yeah, I totally identify with Chuck. Yeah. It's weird to think, like, uh, how did Chuck end up in that group? Like uh, or actually some of uh, Beverly's character is much different than, you know, the other people. But it, it works while you're watching it. Yeah, he wanted to get a bunch of different people together that all had a different energy level, a different vibe, a different vibration, you know, like he was, that's what he was looking for. People who had different rhythms, you know, and different vibrate. Like Miguel comes in, it's like, the fuck is that? Who the fuck is that guy? You know, he's a smooth black guy, like cooler than everybody, anybody. Yeah. Takes his time, pauses before he talks, like, what the fuck? Dressed <laughs> like, you know, it's like, he really, he really had an eye for, mixing and matching people because then the old guys yeah what a mix and match job that was and yeah. just it worked you know he really put a lot of different despair you know radically different things together in something that became this i don't know collage you know and it was wonderful dan o'bannon i'm nothing but praise i think genius yeah. original thinker so i have nothing but praise we didn't have any personal arguments i i got i didn't you know he goes i cast you do your thing, you know, and that's what I did. And it's out of my hands, you know, it, it's someone else's for someone else to decide. Mm -hmm. So when I look back on it, I'm just, I'm grateful. I got to be in that thing. That's become a real thing. Yeah. And um, what, what do you make of like the rise of uh, zombies? Because like I grew You're up well. with, with weird zombie movies and I always loved them, but now like, like I couldn't go into Walmart. Well, there wasn't Walmart then, but I couldn't go into Kmart or whatever and buy a zombie <laughs> t-shirt. And and now like you can buy you you could buy kids zombie shirts or zombie lunch boxes and it's very strange how mainstream zombies have become. Yeah, well, so we made the first <clears throat> zombie, right? Because yeah. Dan O'Bana was a creative thinker; he had original thoughts. So we made a zombie, and it has caught on. The genre has caught on. It's hard to make a zombie movie that's, you know, I love Z world, but I mean, I, you know, zombies are just kind of like, they're part of our culture now. And what were the names of those night of the living dead? Yeah. That's a fucking classic, right? Oh yeah. 
and the sequel to that, unbelievable. Yeah, that's but my fav- this- that's probably my favorite is Dawn. But yeah, yeah that's just I- insanely good. Mm-hmm. And I've seen a bunch of the comedy ones with Woody Harrelson, hysterical, like in the English guy, you know, and wakes up in zombies, hysterical yeah, shit. Zombies. Then there's the serious ones, Twenty Eight Days Later and Z World. Then there's the Walking Dead, which is its own thing, you know, like that's it's, it's a that's a whole generation of zombie lovers that I that I'm I'm all I'm past that, you know what I mean? So, but uh I don't mean I mean I'm just too I didn't it's over, you know, that that I'm so happy for them. Yeah. The Walking Dead people can have a thing, you know, like but yeah, we did a zombie movie where people thought zombie movies were the weirdest fucking thing. The weirdest thing like that's never a zombie movie like <laughs> yeah. But now, as it turns out, like I haven't seen any of the me- the remakes or anything of Children of the Corn or of Return of the Living Dead. I don't I don't go to I don't I'm not invited to do them. I don't go to see them or anything like that. But I I understand that it's a it's a whole franchise, you know, like these movies. So God bless them. Yeah. I was in one zombie movie. It was cool. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't because there are uh, some characters, not even characters, but actors who pop up in the sequel who play different characters. But it's very odd because it's like you know. They kind of wink at the camera, like, "Oh, we've done, this seems like we've done it before." So it's very bizarre, but so no one had ever asked you to do any of the sequels. They, no one's ever asked me to be in a sequel of anything that I've done. Point Break, Children of the Corn, Turn of the Living Dead, North Shore. Nobody, nothing. I think Return of the Living Dead is the first one where, like zombies are eating brains like now everyone just associates zombies are going to eat brains but i don't think that was a thing to they ate people but it wasn't a, like they specifically wanted to eat brains until the return of the living dead yeah i'm not the best person to ask about the zombie encyclopedia of like, right. you know, what has changed, but i understand that return of the living dead did change dan obana did change some of the behavior of zombies you know to influence them then you take that and move forward you know now everything's meta and you know like yeah. referencing things well so. you kind of say like dan o'bannon had to reinvent zombie making a zombie comedy and now people have to reinvent it and make it something different today yeah. or else you're not going to stand out right because we've seen all the zombie stuff you can get everyone's they, they do surprise i always think uh because i grew up loving zombie stuff and after a while it's like another zombie movie but every once in a while one pops up that's like oh they did something different and this is fun yeah but what kind of horror movies do you like because you said you grew up watching horror movies I was a child in a scary household, broken home and scared. And my imagine fantasy was my first addiction. And I would fan and I would stay in on the weekends and watch black and white horror things like this TV guide had come in black and white and I'd circle horror, terror, horror, terror. So what that meant is Wolfman, Frankenstein, invisible man, creature of the black lagoon, you know, like the haunting. You know, and then when, you know, I got, you know, and just making monsters, you know, making the wolf man, the invisible man fucking scared the shit out of me. Like I was, I love so it. I have a lot of behind me here, different guys, but the uh, invisible man, I think is the most underrated universal oh, monster movie. I think very evil when he wrecks that train and laughs is fucking awesome, bro. Dark, dark, dark yeah. shit. But, um, and, and just made my life. I was a, I was, you know, just all about blood and guts and horror and monsters when I was a child. Then I grew up a little bit, but then by the time Exorcist came out, I was like, whoa, you know, fuck, that's scary. They made a movie like, you know, for people like me, you know, that's scary. You know, Exorcist Dome and stuff like that. I really love. Then I got older, you know, and I got into other things, but then I came back to horror. And now what I look at, like when I was, you know, I think I like when it started with like Black Christmas, these sort of dark horror movies. And then I liked some. You know, I saw some of that Eli Roth stuff, but what I really, what I became, you know, love was Midsummer and yeah, I'm I, and and The Witch, and uh, that thing with Gabriel Byrne and I mean all these A list actors. Hereditary. Hereditary. Yeah. When I saw that, I was like, oh my god, that what have they done? They've fucking, they've really taken it to another level. Just like in sports, we we do things now we never even imagined possible when I was in my twenties. Kids are doing that. You couldn't even, you never would have imagined they would be able to do. Same with horror, hereditary, Midsummer. Like, I mean, I like this movie, the 
um, House of the Devil. I think. Oh it was yeah, that's great. Yeah. Right? How great was that? I'm like, oh my god, this is like an old school horror movie from yeah. when I was a fucking kid. Yeah. You know, and Mary Warrenov's in it, who I'm a big fan of. I think it's the last movie she. It's made. amazing. And now I really like the you know the XXX you know and the yeah. this... and they're all uh, maybe I don't know if you probably know, but that's all Ty West movies. Yeah, so. Ty West. Yeah. Huge, huge fan. So I love, I love horror. Love it. What they did, they did a remake with a bunch of pretty girls on this evil. No, it wasn't Evil Dead. It was like, it might have been the third one. I don't know. Anyway, just beautiful shit. Movie stars in horror movies. It's great. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I go to, the, I go to the movies every weekend because um, I, I love to, I love movies, not just horror movies. I go see everything. But it does seem that um, independent horror movies or horror movies in general are the movies besides the giant blockbuster movies that still like play theatrically and a lot of people go see. Yeah. That's right. There's these huge tentpole, you know, cartoon movies, and then there's like two horror movies on. It's like, oh, I'll go see those. People yeah. are really, you know, there's no green screen. It's, you know, people are, it's weird. It's not a cartoon. It's a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> They're still making them. They're still, and they make it into the theaters. Yeah. And you thought the conventions, you know, there's not a rom-com convention as far as I know. And they're definitely not all over, all over the country like horror movie conventions are. And I like I like to watch Siskel and Ebert old episodes sometimes because I grew up watching it and it's fun for me. But sometimes there'll be a movie on there that might have been up for an Academy Award or it was big. And I was like, man, I either don't remember it all or I was like, oh, yeah, I remember the movie, but I've not thought about it in 20 years. And but uh, like these weird horror movies, like still have like a rabid fan base. I think it's very interesting. It is interesting. I hope my cat makes an appearance. Yes, we normally have animals pop She's up behind here. me. What's the cat's? What what is her name? This one's name is Loki. Come here, Loki. Oh, I have a hi. cat named Loki. Actually, I got you, you little beast. Look at this little kitten. There you are. Very cute. I love you. I, love I notice many kid. horror people are uh, are uh, animal people. They're, I think good people are animal people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of horror people are cat people. <laughs> <laughs> Obese. Yeah, I love him. I love her. Yeah. Sorry for that. No, stuff. no, that's uh, I'm 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 happy. I, I'm well, a I mean, that person. And... Apparently, horror. You know, uh, you know, people become addicted to the chemical it releases in your brain. You know, some people like it, and you talk to a lot of people like, well, I don't go to horror movies. I don't. I just won't do that. I don't know why anybody would. You know, and then other people are like, I just love horror movies. I love horror movies. I love what they they go see everything. All horror movies. You know, and it's like. That it's our thing. I love them. I love what they do to my brain. I'm kind of addicted to. Uh, I, I happen to be the kind of person that enjoy that gets off on that rush of a horror movie. You know, a good horror movie. So yeah, there's no rom com conventions or there's no western conventions or surf movie conventions. Those are those are you know big movies that I've done. Yeah, I go to conventions for the low budget horror movies I did, and those are the things that keep me you know keep me going. Like give me life. You know, give me a second life, and I love it. Before the conventions, like, because you even joked about, should I remove my name from Return of the Living Dead? Yeah. Like, uh, did you know that these movies had a following? Oh, no, no, not for 30 years after. I think American Cinema Tech contacted me and said, hey, we're going to show Return of the Living Dead at the Egyptian in Hollywood. I'm like, the Egyptian in Hollywood? You're going to show Return? Yeah, we'd like you to come. I'm like, okay. You know, I'm like, no one's going to be there, but okay. I go, there's lying around the block. People are coming up for autographs. I know, what the fuck has happened? <laughs> You know, that whole thing happened without, I, you know, at a time when I'd literally had forgotten, you know, I, I was like, people love this movie. You know, that's a whole surprise to me and probably everybody that had anything to do with it. You know, like now, I mean, you'd have to talk to Jamie Lee Curtis about it, but, you know, she comes from, you know, Royal Hollywood royalty, but she also does a low budget independent horror movie because she's an actress and she wants to, you know, be an actress in Hollywood. So she has to take this slasher movie this low budget stupid ridiculous movie and it became the greatest thing of her life you know and yeah. she came back to it to give and promote and work hard on getting people in there to see it and it became this you know she went through that whole cycle so mm -hmm. it was wonderful hi terrible troy it's my brother terrible hello troy there here. <laughs> hello so yeah i mean i don't think anybody knew and now they're like grateful yeah so uh movies like uh so the surf movies do they have like a rabid fan base like i i'm just not in the i know yeah, plenty of great, like, yeah i mean there's a lot of yeah there's a it's not rabid 
<laughs> there's fans, huge fans yeah. that, you know, and it changed their life and they live for it, but they don't do the things like horror conventions do. They don't want to come and pay you for your autograph. You know, they, they'd rather just send you like send it to you in the mail going, we sign these, but no, it's just not a, it's not the same thing. You know, it is just a different thing. It's a different culture. You know, it's, it's just a different culture. The Westerns and the surf movies, you know, they have their own culture, you know, but it's not like horror or sci-fi, you know, you know, I, unfortunately I wasn't in any sci-fi hits, but, but no, but still hit, time. Yeah. Wasn't I was in yeah, stories, exactly. and stories, but, but, um, you know, but horrors like got its own, is its own great monster. You sir, you, do you still surf? Yeah. All whenever I can, I still nice. keep surfing and I go surfing if it's really good. And I teach surfing, you know, adult beginners is my specialty. So uh, what was uh, uh, doing uh, Point Break? What was uh, Patrick Swayze, Keanu Reeves? What were they like? And what was that? What was it like doing this, this big, you know, movie? Mm. Patrick, I'd worked with on a movie before, Grandview USA. Oh, okay. And so we were already acquaintances, but we became great friends. He became just the most supportive, loving guy to our group. And he would personally drive us up to his house in Arrowhead, take us water skiing and take us skydiving every weekend Wow! for 10 weeks while we're making that movie. What a mensch, what a beautiful, generous, wow. loving man. He also gave a hundred percent like in rehearsals, whether he's on camera or not, that's a little daunting when you're, you know, have to play football against them. It's like, why are you doing this, man? The camera's not even on us. He's pulling a body block. I, think I broke my hip, but, um, just a wonderful, sensitive man, but just more loving than anyone I've ever met. And then there's Keanu, wow. who is the smartest guy in any room he walks into, but he'll never let you know it. He's so humble. You know, like he just knows everything about everything. He's got a photographic memory and he's interested. So he knows everything about philosophy, astronomy, chemistry, music, theater, you know, but he doesn't ever, he would never let you know that, you know, unless you're, <laughs> who's that guy like? Some one guy's on to him. He does that late night talk show. Um, he does Agandas ice cream, you know. He pretends he's conservative. Steve Corbell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cor is it Corbin or yeah, I know he means surf uh you no, know, he's very yeah. you know, he's not he's actually a liberal man, but he plays Yeah, his, yeah. But that was his character on the on the daily that was his show. Character. Yeah, that guy is that guy yeah. does a talk show every night and he he has Keanu's number, so every once in a while he'll Corbert, ask Corbert. Him. Corbert. Corbert, yeah, a question yeah. and Keanu will answer it and he'll just you know, he'll just be blown. He'll just be fucked. Thank you, man, for coming back. But, but you know, that, that guy's not a normal human being. You know, he's just not normal. Neither, neither those two guys are not normal human beings. You know, that you know, just not normal people. So I was very, very fortunate to have known Buddy. And then obviously, look at what Catherine Bigelow saw in Keanu Reeves. You know, she just saw this guy that was played stoners. You know, like, yeah, I want him to play it with Patrick Swayze, the lead in my movie, you know an FBI quarterback and people are like, what? That's owner skateboarder kid. No, I think he could be, you know, a man. He could, I think he could play him. He could be a, that stoner kid that talks like a fucking, <laughs> like he's stoned. <laughs> and then she's like, yeah, I'm, that's who I want. You know, mm -hmm. I see something in him. And that's another, like Dan O'Bannon's a visionary genius. Catherine Bigelow's a visionary genius. She yeah. can see something that no one else sees and create it and then bring it to the world. And all of a sudden, the world has something new they never knew they had. Wow. I, I really thought it was cool him to after. So he gets like away from all that and re, reinvents himself as like this giant movie star. And then he goes back and does, you know, goes back and does another <laughs> one of the, the one of the, the uh, Bill and Ted movies. Right. And I was like, that's pretty that's pretty cool. I, it must. I, I assume that character must mean a lot to him to, to go back and, and like do that after being. Yeah, I think, you him. know, I don't think he could hurt his career at that point. <laughs> no, that's true. Right, right. I don't like to have he any must, interest even doing it. You know? He must love Alex Vinter, you know, so, yeah. Alex right. so much. And he must go, like, okay, I'll do it. You know, like, <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. This isn't going to hurt that bad. You know, I'll do it. <laughs> Yeah. He could be uh, off, you know, doing Shakespeare, you know, in the park and stuff, but, you know, he can do anything he wants, you know. So we're just lucky to have a guy like that around. Uh, Chrissy uh, Rengren wants to so do you have any advice for her as a filmmaker? 
make movies on your little phone and just make as many movies as you can start cutting them together and putting them on YouTube or wherever you want, you know, write them and make them. And as a novelist, you know, writers got to write, you know, it doesn't matter if it makes sense. You write and then you rewrite and then you rewrite, you know, it's hard to get your friends to read them after a certain point. It's a long <laughs> process. Don't think it happens overnight, you know, but read great writers and write. That's the best advice I was ever given. And uh, do you, um, well, what kind of memories do you have of, uh, of Mark who played uh, suicide in Return of the Dead? Cause he died very young. So didn't, yeah, yeah. Know, My memories are only of him on the set. So I'm in character and he's in character and he's really good. Intimidating, big, macho, handsome. Offset, he's just a sweetheart, light, super nice guy, you know, like, <laughs> but you know, that's a commitment that, that haircuts of that thing's a commitment. So I liked him, but we never, we never got to talk. I never got to be friends with any of those people except Tommy Matthews. Cause we had some mutual friends. So I'm seeing Tommy around, but it wasn't until I started doing conventions with return of living dead that I got oh. to know Beverly, you know, and Jewel and Tommy and, and, in ways that, you know, like, Oh, and, 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 James, you know, would come to these conventions, you know, they all would clue. It was wonderful, man. Oh. I can't believe it. It was so wonderful. I'm, I wish I was sober the whole time, but I wasn't, but, um, I still have great memories. You know, I, I'd love to go back in time and be sober for all those times we had while they were alive, but I only know them now because of conventions, not because of during the movie. I never yeah. hung out with them during the movie. Right. I'd go do my thing and leave. Uh, where can people uh, follow you online to see, you know, what conventions you're going to be at? Because it is cool. I I had in my notes, but you brought up anyway about seeing you doing the Children of the Corn with uh, Courtney Gaines. And yeah, it's the 40 year anniversary of Children of the Corn. So we're doing 10 conventions. So if you go to horror movie conventions, I'm going to San Antonio tomorrow, Texas. Nice. But but, <clears throat> you know, Days of the Dead, we're doing a four different ones of those in four different states. Monster Mania, I think, and uh, some other ones. But um. I don't know, like there's horror convention things. I usually post it before I leave on the weekend for where I'm going. And uh, I'm on Instagram, I'm right, easy to find. I'm on Facebook, I'm easy to find. You know, I'm so easy to find. I'm too, I made it really easy if anyone wants to find me, I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> what? Well, that, that, that's good. That's how I found you. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> and are you, are you all working on anything currently? Yeah, I got... I have two projects I'm working on. One's called People Pleaser with Andrew Capper, which is a horror movie about rehabs in Topanga Canyon in Malibu. Oh, wow. It's dark. I play a kind of a culty drug dealing guy that under the guise of come, let me get you sober. I'll just bilk your insurance, addict you to my drugs, make you work for me and then Ooh. kill you if it doesn't work out. Good horror movie, super scary. And then I just booked a fan film called Days of Sodom. Cody Falk, which is a Crow fan film. I'll do that in Washington, okay. D.C. in uh, this summer in July. I play a detective. That's very cool. So what, what, are you what do I get to say in that movie that's from It Can't Rain All the Time? I get to say that yeah. one. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. And uh, So uh, what are your thoughts on fan film? Uh, because there, some people are against them, but uh, they're very popular, and I see a lot of uh, cool people involved in them. I don't know anything about them. I just left SAG. I, I was in SAG for 40 years. I, I just went FICOR. Now I can do non-union movies, which means I can do oh. fan films and low budget horror movies and non-union, whatever. And I, I'm going to do, you know, I, what I care about now is different. You know, I don't have the union telling me what I, what I can and cannot do. Right. I just look at the script, the, the, the character. Can I, am I interested in playing the, the character as written in the script? When does it shoot? Does it match? Does it work for my timing of the things I have going on in my life, my schedule and how much money does it pay? That's all I care about. You know, those, those are the three factors. Do I want to do the part? Can I do the part in my life schedule? And what does it pay? I'm just curious what it pays. You know, it's got to pay. I don't do it for free because I've got a million things to do in my, that I love doing in my life. So, but being available for non-union films, life changer. Now I get to act for fun. Oh, I bet. Do stuff I, I enjoy for fun. I mean, Nicolas Cage, you know, he was kind of forced to have to do some stuff. People know he, he was owed, owed money and stuff. But he's yeah. he said in interviews that it's the most fun he's had these last, you know, several years doing these independent films. And oh, a lot yeah. of uh, it's some of my favorite movies he's been in. He's I love Mandy and just he's in all these really weird 
some of them horror movies and uh he's great in them and he enjoys doing them well i'm glad to hear that i mean actors want to work you know like i went through a dry spell you know a desert where i just didn't work and now i love to work and so you know actors love to work so it doesn't have to be a big budget thing you can see somebody loving his job and doing well and entertaining you oh, in a yeah. low budget non-union film and that's my goal that's my life right that's totally my life right now oh that's well, excellent yeah this has been great having you on and i know it's the hour here so uh i mean we'll do a uh, part two at some point <laughs> that was really fun thank you so much thank you yeah this was great i'm glad Thanks, we finally buddy. got you on yeah so am i i'll see you guys at the conventions yeah excellent you, thank, thank you. you so much john pleasure I'll, I'll I'll get you out of here because sometimes it's awkward. <laughs> All right, very cool. All right, that was great with John. How are you doing, Mister Jones? Terrible one. I'm, I'm good. The computer was fighting too. me. I forgot to mention too. Living Dead last week was playing at Coolidge uh, oh. Corner Theater. Uh, th an original 35 millimeter print. Which is That's a, pretty awesome. Midnight movie. Yeah. But go on. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. No, no. Rude. I'm just. I was fighting with the computer. That was oh, okay. my last hour or so. So I don't really have any good stories to tell from that. Well, do you want to show some something here? Oh, yeah. This well, it's is, funny because uh, the first time I saw The Return of the Living Dead mm -hmm. was in a theater that doesn't even exist anymore. Oh, which one was that? Uh, the Wayham, airport maybe? cinema. Oh, over in Hyannis. Yep, yep. Before it moved over to the mall. Yeah, I it, as I, I told Back when John, it was on the Kmart side. Like I always love Return. Uh, I don't know if you people can know. So I was wearing Return of the Living Dead shirt. Always a huge fan of the movie, and like as a kid, I loved it because of the zombie stuff. Oh yeah. And uh, as as you watch it, as you get older and stuff, like uh, I still love that stuff. But I think it's like kind of a perfect horror movie because it's got it's got great. The comedy really works. Uh, the horror stuff works. The zombies look great, and and yep. all the gore scenes. It's very fun, and yep. uh, great cast of both veteran actors and and young actors, and so it, it's kind of really, it works on every level for me. I think. Yeah, the timing's so good with everybody too. Like the comedic bits, like everybody's just in sync with everyone else. It's it's such a nice thing. Yeah, and the um. It's funny because part two, I don't want to uh, rag on it, but I, when I was a kid, I loved part two because of the funny zombie stuff. And I watched it, you know, as an adult, and I was like, oh, this is a pretty bad movie. But but it's uh, it's <laughs> fun, I guess, but it's not nearly the same. So, and yeah, uh, Children I, of the Corn is something that we always. Once. Yeah, and Children yeah, of the Corn is something. Oh, uh, the second one? Yeah. Two, yeah. Children of the Corn is one uh, Troy and I always liked, but um, oh yes, used to be. It seemed like some people really didn't like it, but I think it's uh, really grown in popularity, like a lot of things over the years. Seems like it's uh, you know people, are... but they made like twelve sequels, so <laughs> no, they did really like it. Yeah, somebody liked it anyway. Yeah. All right. So Severin Films, um, we're starting to work with Severin Films here, and they sent a bunch of uh, Blu-rays and. Uh, and stuff here. Let's we'll talk about them here. I haven't yeah. watched them yet because I just got them. But Ooh. so let's see. This one on the first on the list is uh, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. Nice. I think that's. What oh, that's I even cool. like the cover. Yeah, it's sweet. It's a slip cover. Nice. Ooh. This is a Blu-ray. Um, a deeply twisted shocker. You will never, ever, ever find a psychotic she monster more blood chilling than Susan Terrell. That's uh, Chris Alexander, former guest on the show, coming soon. Nice. It remains, uh, remains the most joltingly violent psychosexual grindhouse shocker of the 1980s, directed by a veteran of I Love Lucy and starring frequently no. shirtless former teen idol with an epically demented performance by an oscar nominee and now butcher baker nightmare maker can be experienced for the first time ever in ultra high def hmm. jimmy mcnichol stars as an orphan high school student raised by his strangely overproductive aunt, overprotective aunt who becomes implicated in a grisly murder investigated by a 
psycho I'm sorry, you don't have much light here. Psychotic police detective Bo Svensson, seven time nominee okay. Julia Duffy and Bill Paxton in one of his first. Oh, sweet. Films. That's a that's a good uh good cast. Yeah. Jaw dropping hunk of genre insanity. And it's from the eighties. That's so yeah. weird. You figure like one of us would have stumbled across it, you know. Yeah, I've never seen it, to be honest. So, um, yeah. scanned in 4K from the original camera negative with six hours of new and archival special features. Oh, wow. sweet. So, it's good. That's uh, right up our alley. Yeah, multiple audio commentary tracks. I'm a big commentary track fan. Yep. Uh, with the uh, star Jim McNichol, one's with the writer producer, and then there's yeah, there's a multi three different audio commentaries, which is awesome. So it's basically like you have four versions of the movie in my that's opinion. so much fun, yeah, yep. And then you've got uh, Blu ray disc two, also it's the same audio commentary, which is kind of strange. Extreme prejudice interview with uh, interviews with the cast, trailer, and TV spot. So boom. I'm liking it. Yes. So I might, I might do a, start doing some video reviews here on the, sh uh, on the website. So, uh, sub subscribe here. Oh, that sounds like fun then. Next up by seven. You can all pre-order these from seven films. We have the great alligator. Whoa. Well, oh, I love that. Nice. Yeah. Even <laughs> if you just want to collect, you know, the box. Oh art. yeah, absolutely. That's nice awesome. Slip cover. 4K. I don't know. Hopefully, I can play a 4K Ultra. I don't know what I that might be out of my. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, might, have to, I might have to buy a 4K uh, Blu-ray player. Uh, director Sergio Martino uh, combines a monster reptile with an all-star Euro cult cast for The Great Alligator, one of oh. the most outrageously entertaining Italian jungle carnage movies of them all. Great Italian horror movie. People are get eaten. The locals get angry. And eventually all that's left is a stack of bodies and buckets of blood. The final showdown is a work of art. Wow. That all right. I'm down good. with this. Uh, so we got the exclusive. Uh, this is the web store exclusive slip cover. It's got um, interviews with the cast. Um. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Interview with the camera operator. That's interesting. Whoa. Um, yeah, that's something you very rarely see, I think. Yeah. Three friends and an alligator, which is a roundtable discussion. Oh. All kinds of, uh, lots of cool features on that one. I don't think it has a commentary track. Next is uh, Kathy's Curse. Ooh. I dig it. I like it. Spooky eyes. The spooky eyes are going to get you. Exactly. Utterly bizarre and kind of brilliant. <laughs> Operated on a plane of existence far removed from our own, it rewards repeated viewings once you've fallen under its crackpot spell. It's been yeah. called chilling and disturbing, an absolute revelation, and unlike anything you've ever seen, now experience a director's cut, an American R-rated release. Well, who wants to watch that? We want to watch a director's cut. Yes, of uh, Kathy's curse and for an ultra HD for the first time ever. So it's got audio commentary by uh, Fangoria contributors. <laughs> Interesting. So that sounds cool. Does it have an extreme close up of the spooky eyes in the? I uh, hope so. The director's cut. Yeah. I hope so. Whoa. Uh, let's see. It says that it's got. Uh, Possessed, oh, let's see. The dead on's ventral spirit possesses a child that will unleash an unnerving nightmare of creepy mediums, demonic dolls, and plenty of sick 70s foul mouth Moppet mayhem. Now, this sounds like a movie. Whoa! Hey, that was my impression. Multiple audio, com uh, audio commentary, it's got interviews. And then the last but not least here, we have The Devil's Honey. Ooh. Okay, I dig it. A sleazy, it's a sleazy masterpiece. masterpiece. All exactly. right. I dig that. 
This is a Lucio Fulci film. The Devil's Honey. I, I'll be honest, I've not seen any of these four. In uh, one of the most, I'm definitely intrigued. Yeah, in one of the most twistedly intense films of his career, Lucio Fulci takes on the erotic thriller genre and unleashes an onslaught of glossy depravity, wow. depravity, in, in ultra HD for the first time ever. I'm down. Uh, let's see. A tour, tour romance, rampant nudity, woodwind induced orgasms, and a cavalcade of kink to deliver what the digital bits called one of the sleazier films Fulci has ever made. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, so it's got a trailer, Sex Lies and Videotape, which is an interview. Archival audio interview with Lucio Fulci. Lots of tons of interviews, which is cool. Um, an audio essay in an alternate opening. Very nice. cool. Also list the church and the sect that they did not send you those. But that's all right. Or maybe that's like good. coming up. Maybe. Damn. Very cool. Very cool. Maybe there's something inherently sleazy about, like, you know, Italian artists. I don't know. There's a lot of kind of sleazy cats. I like always hear that about, like, Milo Manara and stuff. You know? hmm. Yes. All right, Troy. All right. So what else is on your mind, my buddy, my pal, my brother, my amigo, my compadre? Um. In the world of horror, let me see. Well, I saw they're remaking some stuff. Some Ooh, piece, some some stuff I don't care about. Like, so people get mad about any remake coming out. Yeah, that's true. So one of them, I don't necessarily disagree with people being like, "What's the point of this?" But Bloom House is uh, doing a remake of Blair Witch, and I that one to me is just unless yeah. you do something completely different, and then like. The thing is, I don't think you could and do just something make a different, different movie. You know, if like if if you were geeked by the old one, which I was too, and then like make a completely different movie. You know? Yeah, it, it's so much of that time period, mm. and it's so much. Uh, you know, it's like the first of its kind. I know, not technically there was there was you know a couple found, but it's really for most people their first. Oh yeah, time seeing a found footage movie. It was it was at that time when the internet, like you people had it, but it wasn't readily available. So yeah, it's kind of it in its infancy. Yeah, so it's both the movies out there and there's stuff about it being real, but it's not enough stuff where everyone would just know it's fake. Yep, yep. And now that we've seen so much found footage since, I don't I don't think the movie, if you've seen it for the first time, even sometimes I don't know if it works. But to just to remake that, you're not gonna you're not gonna recreate that moment. No, no, no. You can't forget what you you know. Once you know how to do the magic, you don't. You can't just forget it suddenly. Yeah. So then, yeah, I think you have to do something different. Yep. But then, if you do something different with with the Blair Witch, which is so much about how it's made. Yeah. I don't know if it's like even the Blair Witch at that time, but I mean, I always give something a chance, but it seems, oh, yeah, me seems like a bad movie to remake. Yeah, I'd, I'd just make something completely different if I was them, you know, like yeah. call it Search for, you know, Larry's Witch or something. You know? Yeah, you could be inspired by it. Yeah, and make your absolutely. Own thing. So I, I don't know who knows, but uh, and uh, Blue Mouse for the for me a lot of that a lot of this just very not necessarily bad. It's just very like run of the mill, like whatever. Yeah. Stuff. yeah, I can't remember the last one by them that I was like, wow, that was quite a movie. Yeah, it seems like they really just pump out just very mediocre stuff. Yep, yep, just kind of run of the mill something you'll see everywhere. Yeah. So I um speaking like this is not a a remake but it's a prequel that came out last week and i honestly was not really looking that forward to it but i went to see first omen last week and i thought this was tremendous i think it's one of the best movies of the year i'm gonna have to watch as well oh wow it, i thought it was fantastic it's genuinely creepy 
way weirder and darker than I imagine like a big studio a horror movie, you know, at the theaters to be. There's some a lot of taboo stuff in it. Great performances. Uh, highly recommend it. So I don't want to like spoil the movie, but I the main the main actress is great in it. And it really ties into the, the original Omen series. All right. See, cool. that's great. If it's a good companion piece with the other three, then, you know, that is the way. Yeah, maybe want to go back and watch the Omen movies. I know yeah. the first two I really like. Uh, I can't remember. I don't know. Is the third one a made-for-TV movie, I think? I I don't think so, but I'm, I'm not positive. It's not the one with, um, oh, my God, I can't think of the actor's name. Yeah, the it's the guy. In yeah. the Mouth of Madness. Yeah. And, Jurassic Park and yeah, maybe it's the. Is there a fourth one? I know there's I, a remake. I don't think so. I Omen think. Three: The Final Conflict. Yeah, that must not have been a made-for-TV movie. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe that one's all three of remember. the old ones. Yeah, maybe that's a better movie than I remember it being. I need to watch them all. Yeah, me too. We should do a marathon. Yeah, and so I, I'm looking. Uh, there was an Omen 4. Omen 4 oh, Armageddon. Really? Maybe that was made for TV. Yeah, Omen 4 The Awakening. Oh. No, I don't think I ever saw that one. Yeah, that's probably not good, I bet. No, I can't imagine. You should watch those and then watch uh, uh, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's Good Omens, which is kind of like a spoof of the Omen, which is very good. Oh, interesting. Sam Neill, there we go. Thank Sam you, Neal. Mr. Deadman. Let's see. The Devil's Honey's been added to uh, Robert Richards' list. Nice. He heard the sleaze. He was down with it. The new trailer for Maxine is out. That's right. The third um, installment of... Um, we had Pearl. Well, Pearl's the second one. We had um, X, Pearl, and Maxine. I do like that these are like an ongoing series throughout like different, yeah, me too. multiple decades. I heard, I think there's a, because they all said this can be the last one, but they may make another one. It probably depends on the yeah. success. Yeah. But this one, like they were making right away when uh, Pearl, you know, well, they, you had the ad for Pearl at the end of X, and then you had the uh, ad for Maxine at the end of Pearl. So. Oh, okay. So they had them all figured out then. So that's yeah. good. Ty, made by Ty West, who is a Larry Fessenden uh, guy. So. We're big fans of Les Larry Fessenden. Yes, indeed. uh, Neil still didn't. Oh, yeah, sorry, I did not email you yet, Mr. Coast. You can email me at without your head at gmail.com. Uh, good interview, thank you. Robert watched, uh, watched it about a week ago. Which one is he talking about? I'm sure. Uh, it's probably one of these ones we were talking about earlier. Oh, okay. Sorry. Someone says hyenas. I don't know what that means. Um, it ends abruptly. Well, sometimes. Yeah, I think he met the interview. But uh, we had an hour, so I, I didn't want to keep him long. He had something to do. I think he's actually flying out to Texas, so we didn't want to keep him long. Yeah, if he's got a convention this weekend, he's probably going out now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Naomi Grossman was originally scheduled tonight. Um, Annabelle couldn't be on tonight. And it didn't seem right to not to have to have Naomi on without Annabelle here because a big part of that interview was we were going to talk about seeing her one woman show. Oh, so yeah. that's been rescheduled for next week. So uh, next week we'll have Nathan Cape, who uh, made the new Juggalo horror movie uh, off ramp, oh. which uh, won best uh, premier best new feature film at. Boston Underground Film Festival has been playing nice. bunch of festivals, so that's cool. We're going to drink Fago during that show. As well we should. And uh, so the everyone out there, Dave Deadman, all you folks, get a can of Fago or a bottle of Fago because everyone should be drinking Fago during the uh, Hell yeah. During the movie. And you can get it in a bottle show. or a can? Yes, yeah. All right. Yeah, I have cans, but uh, you can get the bottle. The other... Uh, they call it a remake, but I don't want to get I don't want to get into semantics here. So I don't necessarily consider this a remake, but they're making a new running man. Now, oh, wow. if you make a, a new um, 
adaptation off a novel. I don't necessarily consider it a remake. Right, right. Now, I know they're getting into semantics and technicalities, but the, the I've seen people mad about this. They're like, you can never, you know, do better than Arnold and, and uh, and you know, all these, these guys. Are well, those are with... people that haven't read the source material. Exactly, yep. exactly. Now, I love the movie. I'll be honest. Oh, me too, me too. Super fun. One of my favorite Arnold 80s uh, yep. action movies. Very quotable, very cool, colorful action all over the place. Yeah. Fun time. You know, I'll be back, or whatever, but not, <laughs> not only in the reruns. Or whatever. Yeah. Only in a rerun. Yeah. All this, that's a, it's a very enjoyable movie. Mm -hmm. I read the, uh, the novel not that long ago. The Running Man, the, one of the Bachman books. Completely different. Yep. The, the movie yeah, the main is, character couldn't be any different than Arnold. No, you know? complete tones completely different. It's yeah. not even this, not even the same world. The tone. Yeah, yeah, very bleak in the in the Bachman book. Yeah, very bleak, feel bad movie. Yep, a book. I mean, sorry. Um, yeah, all the Bachman stuff. They don't have happy endings. Yep, and uh, and the movie version is just like. Maybe like us, the premise is kind of the same. The premise is kind of the same idea, and that's it. Yeah. So to do a remake, which I don't consider a remake, to do I've been saying ever since I read it, like now this is one you could do a new version of. You make it oh, more yeah. like the book. Yep, easily. It's a completely different story. Yep. And then it's funny because then you'll get if they keep it like the book and they make uh Killian the game show host. They make him like the book, and then people are going to be like, hey, wait a minute. You know, I've this guy's nothing that. like Richard Dawson. You know, this guy's a black guy. Why yeah. Why do you have to make him well, a black guy? And it's like, well, he's a black guy in the book. The, when it was rumored a couple of years ago, and they had an, I forget the actor that was was rumored to play that role, and I actually saw that. They are like, oh, they're, uh, you know. That's they're, funny. They've got to make it woke. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's actually what the character is in the yeah, the ending of the book is so great too. Like, yeah, because if it does come out like that, everyone's going to be blown away. Yeah, I think the I honestly think the ending is almost you can't do the actual original ending because it's very much like a, a real. Oh yeah, that's a true real too. thing that's happened way after the book, but it's happened <laughs> yeah. in reality. That was kind of the curse of Bachman, though, because then you know, with um, one of the Rage. stories there, Rage, right? Yeah, with the kid in the school. Yeah. And now I don't think they even include that when they have like. No, that's the only the book Bachman that King book. himself has uh, stopped publishing. Yeah, I, it's funny. Like it's a good book. It's not great. It's all right. You know, yeah. it's it's pretty good. It's probably my least favorite Bachman book. Yeah, the Long Walk's really good. Yeah, that's that might be my favorite Bachman story. And uh, that one, they're making I like the Road movie work a lot too. Road yeah, work, I like I Road think work. Make a good uh, good movie. I think Long Walk's a really hard uh, book to make into a movie. They're making it, but I think it's a very difficult thing to make into a film. It would be because it's so much of it. Even even the very end is like kind of in the kids' minds, and you know, like you don't really know for sure. Yeah, what's and going on? I know it seems weird, but like everyone's literally walking. Like I don't know. It's just yep. it's, I don't know if it's a theatrical like thing, but. I mean, I don't know. If you're creative, I, I'm sure you could do it. But. That's true. Like, I that's one I think would be better if, like, you and I made. <laughs> and, like, you know, just got a group of kids and just made the movie. Then, because I think half the story is just the kids' interaction. Like, the back, you know, what's happening around them. I think black and white make it, you know, in Maine. You know, just get 50 kids or how many kids are walking. Right, right. You know, and you could make the movie. I don't think you need a big production. I think that would take away from it. Mm -hmm. Co says, heck yeah, Fago. Then go to the gathering. Oh, okay. There you go. So let me know, Dave, Dead Man and Coast. I actually got a four pack. I'm going to split with Troy here. Of cotton candy Fago. 
some people are like that's probably not good, but it sounded yeah. my choices were cola, which I'm usually not a fan of uh non like I mean, I actually like RC Cola, so maybe Fago Cola is good, but usually yeah. generic Cola is not too good. Orange, which is almost always good of any kind. Yeah. Or Cotton Candy. I'm like, let's go with Cotton Candy. We're going balls out with that one. Mm -hmm. Just Cotton Candy. Boom. Damn. Co says his favorite is the cream soda. Oh, that's a good old school flavor. Yeah, I like, I like uh, cream soda. Dave Deadman says, before ICP, we called it Ghetto Pop. Oh. Pineapple is ultra rare. Damn. Can you sell it like in the black market? Like, hey, baby. <laughs> it's like an insert kind of thing. You know, it's a chase. Right. Uh, they put it on eBay. Man. Yep. I always wondered that about like, because you'd see like Hot Pockets limited edition. And I always think like, I wonder if anyone collects these. Like I've got the, you know. The the limited edition chicken parm hot pocket that was only you sold can't get these like the, anymore, man. The summer of 2011, and you gotta like keep it like you have to have like some kind of deep freeze. For yeah, they got like seven thousand boxes of hot pockets and toaster strudels and whatever else kind yeah. of bullshit you freeze. And then, like you, if you lose power, it's like holy shit! My whole collection of hot pockets going. No, you gotta, you gotta have a generator just in case. You want to lose your hot pockets, sheep. Hot pockets. <laughs> I haven't had a hot pocket in probably five years. Yeah. So, wh what do these guys think uh, about the uh, about this uh, the the uh, cotton candy Fago? Is this a good? Is this I don't a know. good one? I'm out of the loop. I can't help you on this one. Yeah. I bet it's sweet. Probably is. Cotton candy usually is. It is a weird flavor or something. But I saw it and I was like, hell yeah. So anyways. So here is the first time and the only time. Uh, September 2011. Wow. September 7th. When I bought a Fago. It's the only Fago I ever had. <laughs> That was a pineapple watermelon? Pineapple watermelon wow. Fago. That was a bottle when you got that one. Yeah, 24 ounce bottle. I think that was the first time we ever even saw them in it like was. a store. Yeah. Look at that shirt. I still that have that shirt if anyone wants to buy it. I actually had an eBay and eBay took it down. They're like, you can't sell this. It promotes uh it promotes serial killers. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Okay. And there was no way to fight it or anything. Wow. Co says he would drink Fago over Ric Flair's mushroom gasoline <laughs> fist drink. I don't I think Troy will probably never try that because he's not a big mushroom I, guy. I can't do I Besides, like, truffle, I can't do any kind of mushroom. Mushrooms just gross me the fuck out. I used to be very anti-mushroom because it was more the consistency. But once I got over that, I eat mushrooms almost every day. Yeah, not my thing. Damn. The only you one can he can shave remember a fancy community. lad, like, black truffle on myself, but that's about it. Hmm. Yeah. Just got a thing that Firefox crashed. I'm not even using it, but nope. it's popped up on my screen to be really annoying. <laughs> I'll be back so, in un momento. Uh, okay, this weekend um, Arcadia comes out, which is the um, it's the new Nicolas Cage movie. I'm going to go see it. I'm going to see if I, Annabelle wants to go see it, and uh, we'll do a dinner and a movie this weekend. If not, I'll go see it. Maybe I'll... I feel bad. I, I was going to say maybe I'd review it, but then I'd, fe I'd feel like a traitor if I was just uh, out by myself in Boston and just started reviewing a movie. That wouldn't be very nice. But uh, I, I like to see it's playing uh, in Boston. It's not playing at our main theater, but it's playing at some other theater. Uh, let's see. Neil deGrasse Tyson insinuated that if you like mushrooms, you're a cannibal. Really? He thinks they taste like human beings? 
I don't get that. They're very soft and chewy. There's a weird consistency, but uh, I've always read that human beings actually taste more like pork. But I don't know if you know this. I actually tried to get Neil deGrasse Tyson on the show once. Uh, I wanted, I had a specific thing. I thought it would be fun if we talked about like sci-fi horror movies and which one, and we would have went over which one and, and talked about like how close, how actually real is the uh, the science of these movies. Like an alien, predator, uh, stuff like that. I think that would be interesting. Sunshine, which not necessarily horror. Well, it's kind of horror, I guess. Uh, maybe even Frankenstein. This is a great idea. So people out there, I'm telling you, get on Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's all over social media and say, do without your head. We want to hear you. I think it would be fun. He's a fun guy. No, he's smart. He's fun. And I think that would be a really uh, interesting interview for him because I have heard him just bring up movies before in interviews. I was like, man, maybe that's my in. No one's just bringing him on just to talk about uh, the science of horror movies. Um, you might be better off getting the guy who wrote the book Beyond Star Trek. I think I'm freezing up here. What's going on here, folks? Can you still hear me? No, oh, there we go. I had a uh, website open and it was uh, messing me up. So give me one sec. I'm going to go and uh, send this uh, link to myself on a, and I'll open it up on my phone here. I think I froze up momentarily. But we'll be right back. So I'm going to talk about the uh, the films coming out this week. We've got uh, some some new horror movies coming out this week at the theaters. Uh, I notice a lot of cool stuff still playing at the theaters. Uh, Immaculate still playing. First Omen, which just opened last week, that's still playing. Late Night with the Devil still op is still playing. So uh, get out there and see these horror movies because. Um, if people, if you go see them, that means they're going to show, they'll play more of them uh, theatrically. So let's see here. Hey there. Howdy, Bana. Ask, so, what do you think of this idea? I want to get Neil deGrasse Tyson on and talk about the uh, science of horror movies and which ones are, are realistic, like aliens. Oh, I like it. That sounds good to me. Yeah. We, can we just got to like, convince them to do it. Yeah. Well, I was always thinking about that. Like if, uh, if L F Paul Wilson would ever like, you know, agree to it, we could go over like kills and he could tell us which, you know, cause he's a, uh, he's a PD. So he could like tell us, no, interesting. you know, he could tell us, uh, you know, what things would work or wouldn't, or what would have blood squirting out, you know, being an MD. What did I right. call him? A PD. Yeah. He's a medical oh, yeah, doctor. A, so, okay. like, he could, you know. Yeah, I was like, he's a police he detective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Interesting. So, uh, here's uh, one of the new movies coming out this week. Oh, what is uh, that? The Jack in the Box Rises. Huh. Director Lawrence Fowler has been carving out his own little space on the indie horror scene with Jack in the Box franchise, which began 2019. The Jack in the Box continued 2022. The Jack in the Box Awakening. Up next, The Jack in the Box Rises. I like the critter. I think he's cool looking. Yeah, he looks cool. I've never seen any of these. Oh, no. so. gonna have to look into that. Yeah. So it's coming out. Uh, it's out on digital and video. So VOD and DVD. Nice. In this third installment, when Raven is sent to an all-girls boarding school, she unleashes a demon from a mysterious vintage jack-in-the-box hidden on the school grounds. Will the student make it out alive, or will the demon claim the victims it requires to remain alive? Oh. That sounds cool. Yeah, I like it. Get the jack-in-the-box attacking people. Now, I've never watched the show, and I really should. Uh, the new season of Chucky, Chucky Whoa. Season 3 Part 2. I need to I need to watch this whole thing, because I'm a fan of the series. I don't know why I've not yeah. watched it. I'm liking, like, Chucky's starting to look like, like a little mummy or something. Yeah, it looks really cool. 
Mm. I like it. I hate to read this. It's a little bit of spoiler because I'm not watching any, but it says part th- season three, part one ended in a bombshell with the reveal that Chucky is dying of old age. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's kind of empty, though. Yeah. Hmm. So it's on Peacock. Oh, well, I, we, I have Peacock. So. I do not. You got to get it, boy. Uh, too many streaming things. It's there hard it to juggle them all. Whoa, what is that? The feature debut of Dublin-based writer-director Paul Dwayne, All You Need Is Death. Oh. A haunting Irish folktale. That sounds pretty so cool. Yeah. All you need is death. Do, 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 do. Do, do. All you need is death. Death is all you all need. You need. <laughs> In the film, a young couple are part of a mysterious secret organization that travels at night with the desire to discover <laughs> forbidden knowledge. They believe that living modern alchemy is contained in old forgotten songs. Wow. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, definitely like a different, unique kind of take on things. Mm. I'd check it out. When they find a mysterious elderly woman who sings songs that have never been heard before, they open the door to ancient evil and madness. All right, I'm down. I'm all about ancient evil and madness. And madness. I like just evil madness, but if you get ancient <laughs> evil and madness. Oh, yeah. That's even better than like new evil. New exactly. evil takes a little time, you know? Right. Like, figure it out. Chill out, relax, sit in the corner, watch the old evil, see what's happening. And then if you get the ancient evil, Fuck, they've been doing it forever. They know. Exactly. They've got the, the yeah, it's like uh it's like cool cool gulager. They've got exactly the, uh, <laughs> yep. the experience. So I actually don't have a picture of this one, but Arcadian opens uh this weekend, the new Nicolas Cage movie. Oh, I, I think that movie looks tremendous. I can't yeah. I'm that. gonna go see it and Bo- it's playing in Boston. It's not oh. playing at my regular AMC, but it's playing at um it's playing in laser at the AMC Causeway. What the hell is laser? Supposed to fucking blow your mind. <laughs> Supposed to be like insane. the most contrast of any film ever made. I don't know. Oh wow! So that's that's out this week or next? Yeah, week? this weekend. Okay. Open if you tomorrow. End up not actually, seeing it, let me know, and we'll go see it next week. All right. Yeah, I'll see if it's. If, hopefully, it's playing some. Or if you liked it and you want to go see it again, we can see it next week. After a catastrophic event depopulates the world a father and his two sons must survive the dystopian environment while being threatened by mysterious creatures that emerge at night and we don't know if they're vampires or what because they're good in the trailer yeah because they show you all these scratch marks all over their door at night Mm. but you see it's got a little bit of that like um last man on earth vibe so they have to like make sure everything's all locked up tight at night Mm mm-hmm so I, I don't know what the critters are, but Ooh, it's pretty cool because you got Nick Cage and then the two kids from it are, um, oh, the one kid was, uh, yeah, Stutter and Bill from, uh, oh, from, from it. it. And then the other one is uh, the main kid in Lost in Space on oh, Netflix. Oh, sweet. So. Two good young actors, so I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah. Blackout, which we're... Oh, yes. Now you're talking. Larry Fessenden's Blackout, which uh, you can go check out our interviews. We love the movie. Yep. The werewolf movie set, you know, told through, like, uh, through addiction. Yep. So that was awesome. I liked it a lot. Um... Sting is playing. Uh, we can check out. Movie. Yeah, we loved it. It was really fun. Great creature feature movie. Got an interview up with uh, with the star. Her right there. Charlotte. She's great, director. too. Yeah. I think keep an eye out for her in the future. I agree. And then the spider stuff is just awesome. Like, good big-ass spider movie. I love it. I agree. And uh movie, I, I'm having a hard time on this website, bloody disgusting. But uh, Disappear oh. Completely, which I also love. This is a Mexican oh. horror movie. I got to I see it. I, seen that one. I was going to do an interview. It comes to Netflix uh the 12th, so tomorrow. Mm. Um, I thought it was awesome. This is one of my favorite movies of the year out. so far. 
a legit scary movie. It's about a guy who's got like a cur- he's cursed and he lose every day he loses one of his senses. And, uh, yeah, it was great. I-, I thought it was tremendous. I was supposed to do an interview with the guy, and then uh, Netflix who who set up, which is cool, but then they were like. Uh, I was sitting here waiting to do it, and then they're like, "Oh, we want you to do a written interview." Like, oh no, that doesn't really. That's not when you know a podcast that's written a written podcast. Yeah, like, this is fine, but you shouldn't like you know ask me to if you yep. want to do a, a a video interview, and then like, oh, written instead. Yeah, you got to kind of let people know ahead of time. I would think on that. Mm-hmm. I like this to ask Neil deGrasse Tyson if a leprechaun can actually live in space. Ooh. How about if what if can can one live in the hood? That's a movie. <laughs> it is Leprechaun in the Hood. <laughs> yep. I think there's two of them actually. Yeah, back to the hood. There mu- I think they might be the best leprechaun movies, and that's because oh, leprechaun are. sucks. <laughs> It's setting the bar pretty low, and then yeah, yeah. Uh, like people Ice pretend Cube leprechaun. One of those. Yeah, I think so. People pretend the leprechaun movies are these classic films. Shame Coast likes cryptid stuff. I, I, we yeah, we used to have a cryptozoologist on the show, but uh, he passed away unfortunately. Yep. Good guy. Yep. Super nice guy. Um, I wanted to go to his. He he actually taught like a course in a college on yeah zoology. Mm-hmm. I would like to do more cryptozoology shows. Maybe uh, something about the Mothman. Mothman seems to have grown in popularity over the last couple of years. I dig him. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's all bullshit, but I do find it entertaining. Oh no, but it's fun. It's fun bullshit. You know, yeah. I'm good with that. Yeah. So uh, Troy and I are working on a on a short film. Some people try to make me make it into a. It's not that I wouldn't want to do it as a feature film, but it would take a lot more shooting and a lot more uh, money. Oh yeah, but uh, that might I be down a, the road. You never know. Never say yeah. never. That's right. our motto. Let's do this one first, though. Once we do that, then who knows what will happen in the future? Exactly. So we were actually, I was keeping this kind of under wraps, but we, I was actually going to be recording an interview Thursday with Pam Greer, oh, which I was really excited about, but it just fell through earlier today. Oh, no. And they were like, but you can still interview the other people from this. It's like, cool. All these other people I never heard of. But I'm sure it's still a cool, <laughs> cool, cool yeah. project. So, uh, But we do have some interviews coming up. I'll be recording it at various times. So. This is this is not a bad problem. Many different people went on the show to promote, uh, you know, movies coming out, and we can't oh, we can't really do the live show with like you know four or five guests, mm-hmm. you know, all different, you know, for all different stuff. So uh, some of them recorded. So what you have to do, Troy? Oh, you have me. to subscribe on uh, YouTube here. I have Hit that subscribe button. I pounded it. Pound! The I smashed button. it. Smash! I crushed it. Crush the subscribe, and you also have to hit the like button because you don't just want to subscribe. You gotta like it. I'm hitting that. Wherever you're listening, you might be watching this on the X. You might be watching this on Facebook. You might be watching this on the Twitch. Wherever you are, please, or you might be listening to the podcast after it's over, over on uh, Good Pods or Spotify. Wherever you're listening to it. Whether it's now or in the future, go over and find without your head on the YouTube, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and help out the show. Start hitting it all. Exactly. If it's on there, hit the damn thing. Exactly. And if you would like to um, help out the show, you can uh, super chat. Right here on YouTube, or you can Venmo at Hediverse, and anything five dollars or more. Right now, you're gonna get some free stickers. Well, not free because you're donating, but a, as a thank you, you will get a without your head sticker. Nice. 
and a collection of random horror movie stickers that I'll pick out here live on the show so you can see what they are. And they're always yeah. cool things. I've always heard good things, good feedback from people. Yeah. yeah. With the selection right of stickers and what have you. Just, just for example, you got stuff like Jason Voorhees. Um, you got like, I don't want to show too many of these because I want to keep it a surprise. You got yeah. stuff like that. You got a look at this one's really sweet. A stack of VHS tapes. Oh, I like that. Bunch of Friday the 13th on there. I think there. it's all of them. Yeah, it's Friday the 13th That's one through awesome. uh, Jason Goes to Hell, I think, or Jason X, maybe. So they're not all Friday the 13th. There's all kinds of horror movies in there. So, uh, yeah, help uh, support the show because it does cost a lot to run this. Uh, you can uh, Super Chat or Venmo. And coming up soon, we're actually going to have a launch of Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I have to compare the, the two uh, to help fund the film Arbor Day, which is coming soon. Arbor Day. The first without your head uh, written and directed. I can't say the first without your head thing because uh, without your head film, without your head you know, it's putting out the ones to feature smash, but this is completely without your heads written, directed yep. and starring without your head. So. With effects good. by us and everything. Mm. I got Troy to work. I'm whipping them. Like, make, me, make this. Now I got him. The deal is letting me live out my, uh, my Tom no, he, Savini fantasy. Yeah. You're doing great. In fact, I've said this to several people. I think, uh, Troy, sometimes it's reversed. Sometimes I got to keep on Troy to, to do stuff. This is reversed. The fact that Troy's making all this stuff, I'm like, oh, shit, I actually have to make this movie now. <laughs> yeah. See, that was like, my plan. I was like, ah, man, you know, there's no going back now. Here's my fucking tree arm and stuff. And my buddy Andrew, if he's out there, uh, he's in it. He's playing Percy. And uh, he's thought every time I see him, he's like, what about the? I was like, well, soon my plan is. Here's the little look in Arbor Day. The plan is soon to shoot a trailer for Arbor Day. Nice. Um, which will be some of the key characters. This is something's quick. So yep. we can also have a trailer out there uh, with the Kickstarter so people get the idea of it. So oh, that's we, great. We, we'll film that with Andrew and Troy and Brian, hopefully, and uh, get that put together. I have ideas. I, I'm going to track down backwards, Bob. And uh, get that out there, and then uh, and then after we get the kicks, we don't need a million dollars, but just a little bit to cover some of the cost <laughs> and to feed the the, the cast. And uh, oh, hungry, man. yeah, we'll uh, put together Arbor Day. I'm very excited. And then uh, anything you know, if if we happen to get like enough, you know, beyond to what it costs, I uh, would also use um, some of the donations to uh, get the film submitted at festivals because that also costs. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea, Chief. I like yeah, that. Yeah, and some of this money will also not only just for Arbor Day, it's going to go into future without your head stuff because I do. I already bought a new uh, Spiff microphone. I'd like to maybe get a new camera. And so some of the donations will not only just go to, to make Arbor Day, but uh, future projects. Excellent. So, yeah, and, and some of the fake gore we can use in future stuff. So. Can you reuse that stuff? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, like the guts and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can. That's what they do. They stake them and they store them. And... Okay. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, some of the guys that I showed you, like the videos of, they actually have them like on their video and uh, future videos of slaying around. Oh, all right. I didn't know. I thought maybe if you used them once, you couldn't use them again. I yeah, no. Yeah, that's why I think you put the stuff on them and kind of keep Okay. Them. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So. New stuff's coming out. Next week, we got people coming on. Coming on, be coming out. We got all kinds of stuff. Yeah. All right. Anything Good else? Mr. Yeah, anything else, Mr. Jones? I'm um, trying to think. I, nothing in the horror world that I can really think of that's going down. Like, um, You want to see The Running Man? Yeah, definitely. Like, make... um. You Go know, like Sting. the Bachman story. Go see Sting. Go see uh, 
those other new horror flicks that are coming out this week and next week. Yeah, Cadian. Pretty cool. All kinds of new stuff coming out. I like this. Look at this Good shirt times. from my buddies at Paul Bear Press. This is so awesome. Let me uh, grab it for you guys. Damn. Look at this. Boom! It's a zombie from Dawn of the Dead. Ooh. Tie-dye. Tie-dye. That's I bitching. I yeah, love I it. love that shirt. That's awesome. Yep. I would wear that proudly. Happily. Yeah. I'm kind of rocking a cool... um. Lovecraft shirt today. Nice. I, I got that for you. Yes, yeah, you did. A, I've got, I think it's I cool. actually got this Return of Living Dead shirt at that same festival. Actually, did you? actually this is a Paul Bear Press shirt. Then. Nice. Brains. Um, I was going to do Cryptid YouTube before the pandemic. Well, if you'd ever want to do that, I will host it on Without Your Head if you would like. That would be awesome. Yes. If anyone out there also would like to review horror movies, um, hit me up because we get a lot of um, get a lot of stuff and not enough folks to review them. And I, I'm thankful for our reviewers, but they're very, very, very far behind. So <laughs> um, just too much content, you know. It's hard to keep keep up. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there and you would like to do that, uh, I, I kind of like the video versions, but if you want to write write them out, that's fine too. Look at this coming soon from our uh, our buddy, Ooh. Michael St. Michaels. Oh, awesome. And he's Strange doing good. Books. Michael's doing well now. Yeah, I believe they're they're having a uh, crowdfunder um, – uh, screening of Greasy Strangler where the money's going to help pay his uh, medical costs. Excellent. All right. That's very worthwhile. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And who doesn't love the Greasy Strangler except for Gotta idiots? Oh, so uh, the new Nosferatu. Uh, I haven't seen it because it was at a, a convention. It was at CinemaCon. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the, Nosfer the first Nosferatu uh, trailer. Which I was Ooh. really excited about. How does it look? I haven't seen it because you had to be oh, at the okay. convention. But apparently people were into it. The movie evokes the best of classic horror. It's moody, unsettling, and also eerily beautiful. But it's Ooh. not just artful. There's also blood gushing from necks. Nice. Lily Rose Depp being tormented. And gangs of stake-wielding villagers hoping to use folklore to battle unseen evil forces. Sweet. So I'm very excited about that. Who's involved with this? Anyone of note? Oh, yeah. Robert Eggers. Oh, nice. Yeah, made the Vich. Uh, I really liked his last movie, uh, The North Moon. Oh, yeah. Great, great stuff. Any Scars Guards? Lily in Rose. This one? I don't know. I don't know who's playing Nosferatu. too. Uh, oh, yeah. Bill Scars Guard. No way. Oh, that's too he cool. Plays, he plays, uh, yeah, he plays Count Orlock. Oh, that's awesome. I can't get enough no, spooky stuff. Defoe. Guy. Just bring it. Oh, awesome. Wow. That's, right. I like the connection of Willem Dafoe in it, too, because he's also in yeah. uh, Shadow of the Vampire. Yep, which is so good. I love that movie, too. I'm actually drinking decaf ca uh, coffee because uh, a friend of uh, our mom's gave it to me. And I was like, eh, it's not too bad. It tastes pretty good. That's good. After, I, after I'm done with it, I'll probably never buy it again, but it's fine. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, I've Blood and Honey 3. Dark roast. Oh, oh, nice. In my cool Cribbins mug. Who's Cribbins? That's uh, what the Knack MacFeagles say, who are these little blue guys from uh, Terry Pratchett's Books of the Feagles, hmm. the We Free Folk. Their battle cry is, they can take our lives, but they can't take our trousers. <laughs> so Winnie the, 
Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey 3 has been announced. Well, 3 has been announced. Uh, um, I've still not Did seen the second come out? one. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, apparently, that's a lot better than the first one. But That's not saying much, but okay. Yeah, I kind of like the leprechaun, it, Chief. Like, that's uh, it's a pretty low bar. It is. It is. But I, I'm going to see this. I was going to go see it, but it was 18 bucks, and I, and you couldn't use your pass on it. That seems kind of crazy. Yeah. Like, I don't really want to see it that bad. I'm sure, especially at the last one. Mm. I didn't hate as much as some people, but. Saw so, uh, Spike Lee's remaking Speak No Evil, which is an Asian horror movie, I guess. I'm not familiar with that movie. But after old after his like dismal old boy, I thought it was weird <laughs> that he's gonna... Yeah, that's true. You think he'd stop doing that then? Maybe it's just, you know, maybe it's kind of like something he loves and he just decided. It's weird though to, to me, like it. if you love a movie, is it cool to remake it then? Like yeah, I love this movie too. so much, I can make it better. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I love uh Casablanca, but that wasn't, you know, when you were talking about making a short film that that wasn't on our list. I probably no. didn't bring that one up. No, it probably doesn't really fit the, with that your head verse. That could be Peter Lorre, then I definitely verse. want to. Yeah. I sh can I be Peter Lorre in our uh, in our short film? I don't think it fits this one, but maybe in a future one. Okay, all right. That sounds good. I'll just show up and do like the crazy, like you know, oh, I need that wishbone very badly, Leopold. <laughs> you know, I'll do like a bad Peter Lorre from the fucking Warner Brothers cartoons. That'll be good. I know this is not very creative, but I currently have your character's name TJ. That's I like it. I like it. How could you switch it to Peter Laurie? No, it doesn't work. Maybe Pete. Laszlo? Pete Pete might work, but it's gotta be kind of All a right. common, like nothing too outlandish. Laszlo Lowenstein? That was Peter Laurie's real name. Steve the Demon Tree Hunter. All right. And then Leatherface could be Bogey. He's uh, Travis. All right. That's close to Bogey. Yeah. I think the mustache makes him a Travis to me. He, yeah, he does. Brian has a, a Travis vibe. Annadette, Annabelle is Lunadette Sveed. Whoa. Which is the uh, the leader of the cult of Arbor. Well, she could be Lunadette Steed. I could be Sveed. Sveed. I could be Laszlo. No, Lowen no, because I, you're not, you're not in the cult. You're not. Oh, no, all cult. right. You're, you're a recruit. I suck. Of the uh, of the the demon tree hunters. All right. So in the sequel, I can be uh, in a, in another in another short. In an alternate universe, I can be. Well, we, it'll be all connected. We'll keep them in the, right. in the headless universe. Okay, I like it. Co says he was going to travel to places of mystery, like the Fiji forest, Bermuda Triangle. Oh. Wow. So you got you got the cash to do this coast. He's living large. Oh, no, that'd be pretty sweet. But what if you never returned from the Bermuda Triangle? I saw the in search of. I don't know, man. That sounds kind of kind of spooky. Spooky. All right. <laughs> so we're gonna uh, play us out here uh, soon with the uh, music of the month, which will be a fun time let me pull that up and uh we got some folks here in the chat also if you're watching uh if you're not watching live uh come live on thursdays we'll come over to the show i mean maybe you're really excited and you'll do what i just said but come over to the show uh live on thursdays and join the chat room because that's the that's the fun thing to do oh yeah you can always just you know Talk to us, talk to your buddies, make some new friends. Exactly. See your enemies and heckle them. Do whatever you want to do. Yeah, that almost seems like a bar, uh, Conan the Barbarian quote. I think it is. It might be. There's a great quote. You got me thinking about it when you were talking about the uh, the running man. I'm not the running man. Well, the running man, and then we got into um, the long walk. There's a quote by Stebbins and I think it's near the end of the walk 
Mm -hmm. And he said something about the, the carrot and the mule. And I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's something about if you take that carrot away, there are two kinds of people. And one of them, you know, still will continue to go regardless. And the other one is a smarter but very hungry mule. Mm. And it's it's a pretty neat quote. Mm. Stebbins is a great character, too. He's probably my favorite character in The, the Long Walk. So, uh, Electro Darkwave Industrial Body Musician Lumia Dark will be playing us out. Nice. That's a mouthful. Okay. It is. So up, upcoming, I haven't announced this anywhere yet, but after, so we got Severed Limbs coming up this month, yep. April 28th, and the deadline for that's uh, fastly approaching. So you have to get your uh, short films and trailers in if you would like uh, to be part of Severed Limbs 14, I believe. Um, after that, I'm actually going to, we're going to be doing a uh, horror music video festival. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yes, so we're gonna do that. I would also. I'm also planning on re, uh, bringing back Bloody Stumps this year, which was our feature film festival. Sweet. And uh, with that one, I'd like to do live uh, Q and A's after the films, maybe live intros before them. It'll be a two day event. Last Ooh. time, I think four days was too long. I, I think I'm gonna narrow it down to two. Two days. Two days, maybe six movies. We'll awesome. Out. All right, I'm so, looking uh, forward to all that you. jazz. But it's a good time. So for the, all that stuff, you have to go to the, the Twitch. So subscribe here for YouTube for the regular live show and Twitch for the movie stuff. Because YouTube says, you're the redact. You cannot show those bad little thingies. <laughs> you're like, you're a pervert. And then they make me take, uh, I had to take a nudity-like course. Whoa. That's true. I'm not even joking. I had to take a nudity course. Well, should I ask what, what that entails? Yeah, to answer all these questions. And so uh, for six months, we redeemed like a, a pornography page. And wow. then, uh, then then I took the uh, I took the nudity course. And then uh, after, you know, passing that, then without anything bad for the next three months, then they finally took off the uh, the warning. So we're no longer a, a pornography page, but so it was uh, one of the questions was, it was like, Steve says, uh, I love videos of women peeing. It's so sexy. And so he makes a video where he, someone like pees and he eats the snow or something. And it's like, what the fuck? And they're like, no, this isn't allowed on YouTube because of, of urination. This isn't allowed on YouTube, blah, blah, blah. Or this is allowed on YouTube, blah, blah. So I answer stuff. And I had to get it wrong because it's not that you can't put it on YouTube because of urination. You can show urination, according to YouTube, if it's, if it's art or educational. Now, I'm not going to put this to the test because I will bet money that if I make a video where I'm, it's me taking a piss and I say this is art, YouTube is going to take it down and kick me off YouTube. Or if it's education, you're trying to teach kids how to use a urinal. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Because no. the whole reason this started to begin with was there was a nipple in a trailer during Seven Limbs and they said that this was meant to entice someone and i was like well i fought it and said it was art and they said no it's enticement and it was part of a tr movie trailer so if a nipple and a movie trailer is a considered art how the hell is me pissing in snow gonna be considered art it's not it makes me question what pervert wrote these questions yeah some sick asshole wrote these yeah. questions like, ah, don't mind me while I'm stroking one out to while I'm writing these questions here. Now, Steve's really into poo. And in what everything's enticing. Every commercial ever oh, made is meant to entice you to buy it. That's what a commercial is. Yep. 
Yeah, you get the the foxy mama Sita telling you to drink Coke. And, exactly. You know, there's a sexy guy telling you to drive this car. Do you know? That's why the YouTube stuff's always so vague, so they can just they can, if for whatever reason they can just flag you for something. That's why these new ones are out, and they're like, I know they're meant for AI, but they're like, if you like sh- depict. Uh, uh, like a historical character doing something they didn't do, and so I was like, "This is not going to be good because, oh. like, every historical fiction is like Abraham Lincoln didn't fight vampires. Yep. So that's immediately going to be banned. <laughs> and people are like, no, it's only AI. Blah 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 blah. I'm like, I'm glad you have such faith in YouTube because <laughs> I do not. No, no. Oh, that's kind of crazy, actually. Read. All right. Whoa! I took a nudity course and barely passed without a hard D. Well, Damn! Now. Good thing that's educational or else you get banned. Yep, that's true. All right. Until next week, this is Nasty Neil. That would make me terrible, Troy. And this was without your head.
cannot resist to this delicious meat. A pair of pieces just be left there for me.